Welcome to the Matt Kuda Photography Podcast, a podcast about nature and wildlife photography in your own backyard and throughout the United States. Okay, welcome to the podcast, episode 26, Catalucci Part 2. But first, what's going on in my world? Well, unfortunately, my camera, my beloved 1D Mark II, has finally bit the dust. It has breathed its last. It has fired its last shutter. It is no more. You know, it was just it was just one of these things where I was uh, photographing my daughter's uh, soccer game after going to Catalucci, and the lens got stuck on. I tried to fix it. Um, it just it just became a nightmare trying to fix it. It's not worth the money to to get it fixed properly and so you know you win some you lose some you know in this case I mean I think I got my money's worth out of that camera it was a it was a very good camera a good quality camera it was I still recommend that that 1D Mark II for people that are extremely extremely uh, budget minded and want a good birding camera I still recommend it the downside is it's only an 8 megapixel camera and that's in today's world that's a very low low megapixel camera. But anyway, that's that. I'm probably going to have to replace it soon. I I wasn't even saving up money really for a new camera. And uh I still have my 7D, but you know, that that camera filled the role of being my birds and flight camera and among other things, it was just a really good action camera. But uh, in other news, I have introduced a second podcast, I guess, I don't want to say genre, but a second podcast uh, that is coming out on the second week and the fourth week of each month, and it's called Behind the Shot. It's, it's still, you know, it's basically still the, the Matt Kuda Photography Podcast, but it's a special episode on the second and fourth week's to fill in and and keep out keep us all engaged you know keep me engaged with you keep you engaged with me and also hopefully you know share some of my photographs how I took the photograph and you know kind of give hints and tips it's designed to be kind of a, a, a faster format it's designed to be no longer than 15 minutes and so it, it's a, a sharp contrast to my regular podcast which is you know, sometimes up around an hour. So hopefully it'll kind of be a, a good blend. So if you if you want to just get a quick tidbit of information, then, you know, by all means tune into the behind the shot. You know, if you want more in-depth uh, thoughts and coverage and reviews and things like that, then, you know, my, my main uh, podcast episodes will also still be going. So just a just a quick news flash on that my trip to Shenandoah National Park I had to cancel it unfortunately so another another downer for me um, just too much going on in my personal life right now I and the 1d mark II going down it just didn't seem like a good good time to make the the trip so the the wild the, the white-tailed deer trip is off I am planning a trip to the Pocosin National Wildlife Refuge in probably around January to photograph the, uh, the snow geese and, and waterfowl and so forth wintering there. Now, one thing about Pocosin that's a real problem is they have closed down a lot of a lot of the the refuge to photographers unfortunately and it's it's just a sad fact of or sad reality in in the photographic world today that because there are so many photographers and many of those photographers are nefarious unfortunately they've had to close down large portions of it and you know I'm not going to stand in judgment one way or the other I know that there are a few people out there that are giving us a bad name and that's unfortunate, but please, if you're a wildlife photographer, please do your best to at least not abuse the system and 
you know, don't be going out into the fields and flushing the birds on purpose so you can get shots and things like that. You know, even though you're probably not really harming the bird, it, it makes a lot of people upset. And, you know, right now we need to be very careful about how we present ourselves and, and how we are uh, photographing the wildlife. Um, I, I am one that does not believe in, in overpressuring the bird. In other words, if the bird is overly uncomfortable, then you probably need to back off a little bit. You probably need to think about maybe getting into a blind or, or you know, just, you know, you, you got to just use your head is all I'm trying to say. And so, unfortunately, Pocosin is, is becoming a, uh, a place that we can't get the shots that we, we used to get. So I'll try to keep you posted on that. Probably we'll do a podcast episode on that later on the, in the early early 2017 you know other than that i really i really don't know what's going to happen it's 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 just a weird you know when you lose a camera it's it's kind of weird but when you lose a camera it it kind of upsets your your planning it it throws a, a wrench in the works it makes you kind of a little bit negative I mean, like I said, I still have my Canon 7D, although it's been, I got to be honest, it's been acting a little weird lately itself with the shutter. And so, you know, I could be looking at a, a bad shutter on that camera. So you know, things are, things could be better. So let's move on to in the news. What, what's going on in the news right now? I, I kind of searched around looking for an interesting news item. I didn't find a whole lot. Uh, what I did find was that Canon is going to release uh, the 6D Mark II sometime in early 2017, maybe mid-2017. Uh, what we're expecting there is a, is a from all indications, um, according to Canon rumors and, uh, and so forth, we're expecting a 24 to 25 megapixel full-frame sensor, uh, dual-pixel AF, a tilting touchscreen, a new AF system, possibly a 19-point AF system. Uh, we're looking at maybe near-field communication, Wi-Fi, and GPS. Unfortunately, the video is probably only going to be 1080 uh, at 60p. So for those that want a 4K video option upgrade for their 6D, uh, you're out of luck. Now, I have shot with the 6D, um, and I... I I feel like it's a great camera. I feel like the sensor is amazing. Is it a good wildlife camera, a nature camera? Yes and no. If you are going to be shooting uh, landscapes, awesome landscape camera. If you're going to be shooting macro, awesome macro camera. If you're going to be shooting astrophotography, awesome astrophotography camera. Um, if you're going to be shooting birds in flight, no, um, I believe it. I believe the 60 is three frames a second. So I'm not expecting a whole lot more out of the 60 Mark two. Maybe they'll get you up to five frames. Is it doable? Yeah, it's doable. Uh, the autofocus system is not really designed in my mind for, for birds in flight and, and fast action, but for a low light, um, astro camera or, or landscape camera, it's a great deal, a great bargain. I think they're coming in under a thousand dollars now, so on the used market. So yeah, if you're if you're a landscape guy, I see no reason. If you're a landscape guy, I really don't see any reason to even buy a 5D Mark III or 5D Mark IV. I really don't, unless you're into video or something like that. But uh, if you're just a stills guy. If I was a stills guy and I just wanted to pick up a full frame camera, an expensive full frame camera, I'd go with a 6D. Okay, so let's move on to the meat of this episode: the trip to Catalucci. Catalucci. Um, if you follow me, I go. This is my second time there this year, and Catalucci is located in the Great Smoky Mountains on the North Carolina side. So it's in western North Carolina along the Appalachian Mountains. It's actually right in the Appalachian Mountains. 
Uh, it's just north, I believe it's just north of Maggie Valley and just east of the Cherokee uh, Reservation slash city area. It It is a place where you can find wild elk. Um, it, and it's one of the few places on the East Coast that you can find wild elk. Uh, certainly, uh, there are play other places. Uh, one of them, Pennsylvania actually has a place, I'm told. Uh, where they have introduced the wild elk. And I believe they're introducing them also in West Virginia. So if you're in either of those locations, you might want to do some Googling on it. I was going to research it. I totally forgot. I apologize. But I would look in those two states for possibilities. If anybody else knows of any uh, wild elk areas in uh, the eastern United States, feel free to email me. I'd love to hear about it. And I'd love to hear, you know, what kind of opportunities are there. So how do you get into it? it? This is one thing I kind of wanted to talk about briefly. Because if you are someone that is nervous or you have a spouse or family member that's nervous about heights or, or really windy, bumpy dirt roads, you really don't want to take them with you to Catalucci. Because Catalucci is, once you get off 40, um, Interstate 40, you you basically exit, you go a little ways on some on some asphalt roads, but then eventually you start ascending the mountain pass, and it's about a 10 to 11 mile uh, dirt road with very ruddy at certain times of the year. It can be dangerous with ice. Uh, it's a very narrow road. In some places, only one car may pass at a time. Um, definitely would not want to take any large vehicles there, although I have seen people drive horse trailers through there, which is frankly astounding. I don't know how... I, I wouldn't even dare to do that, to be honest with you. I guess I'm kind of a wimp. I don't know. But that pass alone is enough to scare someone that's that's not used to that type of thing. So that's one word of caution. I always mention that because it's I think it's important. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that I did a short video, not a professional quality video or anything. I just did a video of my trip in the Catalucci uh, on this last trip. And that's on my YouTube site. I will I will link to that in the show notes. So go ahead and check that out. But other than that, it's a the valley itself is is about a two mile, I think it's about two to three miles long, something like that. Uh, don't quote me on that, but it's a very short valley. It's not a loop. Some people are really used to loops where you drive in and you you know you drive around a big loop and you just keep going around in circles. That is not the case here. It is one road, um, and you have to allow for traffic to get through. You know, if if someone's coming toward you, you need to pull off a little bit and let them pass. Very, you know, old school dirt roads, um, some paved roads, but mostly dirt. Um, there are some other interesting things there. There's a there's a church there you can photograph. Um, there is there are turkeys there uh, in a great number. There are black bear there, which we actually did see a black bear uh, at a distance. So they're there. Um, but primarily people go there to see the elk. And the elk were introduced to Catalucci somewhere around, I believe it was 2003-ish, a small herd was introduced there, and they have grown and grown and grown, and now they're really all over the the Cherokee um, Great Smoky Mountains National Park area, and they continue to grow, and I think I could be wrong about this, but I'm almost positive that North Carolina even has a small hunting season now to keep their populations down. So they're very, very doing very, very well here. And I'm very happy about that. I'm extremely happy about it because if, if they hadn't reintroduced the elk into Eastern, uh, into the Eastern forests, we would have to drive to Montana or, you know, somewhere, I think Kentucky has a population as well, but we would have to drive, you know, to get there. And I, I applaud the national park service for doing this. You know, I, I I believe in the National Park Service. I think they're doing a good a good thing for us, and you know this is a perfect example. So what I wanted to do, I just wanted to take 
uh, my photographs that I took, this was only a day trip. This was not a weekend trip. And I just want to take my photographs and uh, go through them with you and kind of explain how I took them, the specs and all, and so on and so forth. So there's a there's actually a link in the show notes uh, called Follow Along Images. Just click on that link. It takes you to my Flickr page, and we can go through each one of these. I guess, I guess you know, we'll start with the best. Um, we'll start with the image that I think was the best image of the day. The first image there, it's called Bull Elk. This was an image that was taken fairly early in the morning. I think it was around, I don't know if I have the time on here or not, but I believe it was around... Nine o'clock ish, eight o'clock ish. Um, it was raining that day, and so we had to we had to contend with I had to contend with the rain. But what happened was I I rolled up on the main herd, and the main herd was about nineteen to twenty strong, and there was a young bull elk in the in the vicinity. And this is the time of year. This is the rut uh, when I when I went. It's October, late September, early October is the elk rut and this guy was moving up behind me i actually did not hear him and this is one of the things that it can really literally bite you as a when you're when you're a wildlife photographer is you really need to be situationally aware you you really need to be listening looking um when you're not staring through your viewfinder you need to be looking around observing because you could find yourself in a tricky spot. It's probably not going to happen, but you could find yourself staring right in the right in the snout of a of an angry bull elk if you're not careful. Now, chances are it's not going to happen. Don't get all worried about it and fretting about it, but you know, this time of year, it, you know, during the rut, it can be dangerous. So, do do keep that in mind when you're going out there. But anyway, this guy snuck up behind me, and I it was so funny. I was actually, I had my 1.4X teleconverter on, and I was shooting the main herd, which was, my word, they were probably a good 100 yards away. And I wasn't getting anything good, obviously. It was low light. Uh, I was tripod mounted, and I was trying to get shots of the main herd. And I just happened to look to my left, and there was a, a really nice-looking, in my mind, a nice-looking young elk really uh, a nice specimen the 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 rack or the the antlers had a nice spread an interesting spread not a big huge bull elk like you you would see uh in the main herd but certainly an interesting subject and so what i did was i i kind of worked my way around uh down a tree line i'm actually standing in a tree line for this shot and I worked my way down around so that I could kind of include some of the fall foliage up in the upper left of the image. I was shooting this with my 150 to 600, which is my go-to lens for just about everything. The Sigma uh, 150 to 600 Contemporary. I love that lens. Can't say enough good things about it. Uh, I, here I was actually using my Canon EOS 7D. And I just, I kind of lined him up to the left, a little off center, kind of sort of rule of thirds. I really like his head turn. And one of the things you should understand about deer or elk is when they're walking away from you, they know you're there, right? They saw you there. And what they will do is they'll do a predator check and they'll, they'll actually turn, they'll stop and they'll turn their head in your direction and they'll actually check to make sure you're not following them or approaching them rapidly or that you know and they're also checking for possible like coyotes or you know a bear or something like that that could be behind them so what that's what he's doing here he's actually stopping uh he is kind of checking me out he's he's checking out another photographer that was down about 40 yards from me to my right he's just checking to make sure we're not going to do anything stupid but he was perfectly comfortable, no pressures, happy that we're there, no problems. And so I took a, this is actually about an eight shot burst or maybe a little less than that, maybe a seven shot burst, six shot burst. Um, and the reason that you wanna do that when you're photographing 
anything, especially this early in the morning, is when you fire a burst, a lot of times the second or third image in that burst are the sharpest uh, images. So if you, I were to take just one shot, it might be a blurry image because what happens is when you are photographing, even tripod mounted, what happens is sometimes out of haste or um, you're not thinking clearly, you actually push the shutter button down too hard. And that, that kind of jars your camera. And that those first couple images a lot of times will be out of focus. So that's one of the reasons that we, as wildlife photographers, are so interested in the in the burst. You know, how many images uh, can I shoot before I fill up the buffer? And this is the reason. Things like this. So you might want to shoot a four or five shot burst, six shot burst, and out of that, you know, I in this particular instance, out of that burst, I had about maybe two images that were uh, perfectly sharp. But I like this one. This is my favorite one of the day. Um, again, it was it was shot with my uh, 150 to 600 at only 313 millimeters, f 5.6, one one sixtieth of a second, ISO 1600. So here's a 1600 ISO image with my 7D. So yes, you can do it. Yes, you can zoom into this 100%, and you'll see a little bit of noise, but not that much. Not enough to disqualify this image. Certainly doable. It's, it's all about the the lighting. It's about shoot exposing to the right. If you don't know what that is, exposing to the right is simply overexposing your image without losing the highlights. And in a shot like this, your highlights are going to be mostly the elk's sides. Uh, the elk has a very light tan coat on its side and if you're not careful if you expose for the head too much you will blow out the elk side and actually in Lightroom I did a little bit of retouch here on the side I actually not retouch but I did a little bit of um, burning in on his side right there so that you know you, you don't have that bright blown out highlight uh, the grasses I think work real well here the natural field I think uh, gives him uh, a very natural environment. It, well, it was a natural environment, but it, it makes you feel like you were there in the wild. You know, it just works. You know, it, it's not a, you know, this is not a Pulitzer Prize winning image. This is not a, a contest winning image, but it's a good image and I'm happy. I'm happy I went and I'm happy I got it. Okay, let's take a look at the next shot. Okay, this image is a bull elk and one of his calves. Now, this herd, like I said, was was about 19 to 20 elk. If you count the young bull that kept following them all day, it was 20. If you don't count him, it was 19. And in this herd were some younger uh, calves. There were some. There were a bunch of a bunch of cows, and there was this bull elk. This is the alpha bull pictured here. Uh, he is definitely older. Um, he's he's probably been an alpha for some time. Um, he's not a particularly aggressive bull, so you can tell he's got some age on him. This was a shot that I took after the rain had ended. It was a little bit later in the day, and I like the shot. It's not my favorite shot, but I like what's going on here. I like that we have a nice forest background and that the forest is darkening into the back. You, know, you, just, you can just feel the, the wildness of this image. Uh, I like the fact that the calf kind of offsets the power of the elk. What I don't like about the image, I, I wished, one, that the calf was about eight feet farther to the left. I wished that his head was up facing me for the shot but you know if you've ever photographed elk you have to be extremely patient elk are are a lot like cows that you would see out in a field in your in your you know in your neighborhood or in your community 
they they tend to graze most of the time. Uh, when they're not grazing, they're mostly laying down, resting, uh, chewing the cud. You know, so you have to really, really be patient and just hope something cool happens. Uh, this guy was, you know, it was rainy that day. They were bedding down a lot and wasn't a lot of activity, unfortunately. Not a lot of bugling. But, you know, you you you, you take the positive. You know, you, you learn from the experience and you, you try to get the shot. You know, that's all you're trying to do. You know, all day long, all I'm trying to do is I'm just working the shot. I'm just, I'm working this herd. I'm standing there for an hour sometimes with them not doing a thing and you just you just keep trying to work them and hopefully they'll do something cool uh this shot was again with my 150 to 600 i actually used my canon 1d mark ii this was one of the last images that my 1d mark ii actually shot um i shot at f6.3 one five hundredth of a second iso 320. okay the next image this is what most people would consider this next image uh, a no-no. And the reason that they would say that is because you're, you're not supposed to cut the antlers off of an elk. Okay. Uh, well, any, any deer species, really. You're not supposed to crop the, the antlers out. But in this case, he was very close, first of all. And I wanted to show more character okay I, I didn't want to just show his antlers you know we all get into I think we get we get too much into the antlers I mean the antlers are very cool don't get me wrong but there's more to an elk than his antlers and I think here we have a close portrait you know we can see actually you can see the rain falling in this if you get close enough but uh, you can see that he's been out in the rain his coat is is heavy and wet um, I, I can I can see some character in his eyes. I can I can definitely get a feel for, you know, kind of the character of this elk, if you will. And so I'm not afraid to just get in tight and and do this do this type of photography. Now, again, we're back to the word of caution for the day. This is a rutting bull. This is a very close image. He was probably maybe 15 yards away. But I was in my car. I'd actually retreated. Most of the time that day I was on foot. But I'd actually retreated back to my car because it was raining. And lo and behold, this herd just kind of moved up on me. And, you know, it's okay. If they move toward you, stay in your car, photograph them, feel comfortable. He wasn't mad at me. I wasn't mad at him. We're happy. Uh, if I was out on foot and I was this close, I would be a little bit nervous. Um, because if one does decide to charge you, you are not going to be fast enough to get out of his way. You're just not going to be. Um, I don't care if you're an Olympic runner. You know, these guys can run. They're unpredictable, and they can do an extreme amount of damage. Um, there, there have been bull elk that have actually attacked cars, attacked fences. You, know, you, you don't want to be near these guys they have mauled photographers before even if they approach me i generally will put a buffer you know i you try to get back you know try to keep it about 40 50 yards you know try to get some kind of buffer in there you know do what you're comfortable with but just be careful but anyway uh so this shot was just to, for more impact more more storytelling you know we're trying to tell a story you know when i go out to a to a place like this, I'm trying to tell a story. I'm trying to think about a photo essay and what that might look like. Uh, this was shot with my 1D Mark II, my Canon, uh, or actually my uh, my Sigma 150 to 600 at 200 millimeters, f6.3, 1/320th of a second at ISO 400. One more thing to note here: when I am in my vehicle. I am always using my Grizzly bean bag, and that is just a, a bean bag support that rests on your door or your window and allows you to comfortably rest your your camera 
on your door without banging up your door, or banging up your camera, or ruining your lens. God forbid. So, you know, look for opportunities like this. Look for the close up images because they help tell your story. And don't get creeped out or not creeped out, but don't get angry at yourself for for cropping off the antlers. It's okay sometimes. It's okay. Don't panic. Okay, the next image. I would have loved this image. This is another bull elk. It's a vertical. I would have loved this image if I had shot it horizontally. Uh, unfortunately, I was in a vertical composition mode at this point, and he happened to look up. And I fired off a burst of, you know, four or five shots. Uh, I feel like shots like this, a lot of times, it's really hard to pull this shot off with a large animal like this. And what it, what ends up happening is it, it looks like he's cut in half. It looks like somebody took a saw and cut him in half. And that's not desirable, okay? If you are going to do a vertical of a bowl, it should probably be kind of coming directly at you. And you can include his whole body and everything. I like that shot much, much more. But hey, I, I, I put it out here to show you guys kind of what not to do or what I feel like doesn't work. I mean, you may love it. I don't know. You may think this is great. That's fine. But I just I thought it was a good example of, of a perfect shot in the sense that I got all his antlers in. Um, I've got him looking up. But I kind of missed it. So, this was shot with my 1D Mark II, the Sigma 150 to 600, f6.3 at 313 millimeters, one one thousandths of a second at ISO 320. By the way, ISO 320 is a good, generally is a really good ISO in most cameras. I have found it to, to actually be better, quite a bit better than ISO 400 in many cases. Uh, there's a lot of people online that speculate that you know, with certain cameras that ISO 320 is actually the native ISO versus the 400 is actually a manipulation of the exposure. I, you know, I don't know. I'm not going to get into all the technical. I'll just say that, that it does look better a lot of times. Um, but it kind of should, right? Because it is actually a lower ISO. Um, okay, what not to do was this shot. Okay, next image. Um, this image, I like it. Um, I'm not in love with it, but I think it has some merit. It it certainly helps tell the story, I think. You have a lone calf here. This is simply entitled Elk Calf. You have a lone calf. Um, how do you frame an elk calf in its environment? I tried to use a rule of thirds here because I didn't have a whole lot going on, not a lot of action. Um, but I'm trying to, to tell the story of this herd. And the herd did have several, um, I think it had about three uh, calves in it at various ages. And the interesting thing about this to me is this kind of sort of, I don't want to, I don't want to say for sure, but it kind of sort of tells the story of how the calves get eaten, basically, or so I don't know if you've ever seen this happen before. I've never seen it in the wild, but I've, I've seen documentaries on this. And what happens is the calves will actually get separated or they'll actually kind of lag behind a lot of times. And the coyotes know this. And what they will do is they will try to... Coyotes got their name of uh, being Wiley, you know, the old Wiley coyote from the cartoon. Well, that's actually has some truth to it. What they will do is they will lead, they will lead the young calf away from the herd, and they'll kind of play with it, like the like they're being playful, like they want to play. And the farther that calf gets away, and pretty soon, mom's not watching, and they take it down. And I've seen this, and it's it's a terrible thing to watch, but uh, actually. The cows, a lot of times, will actually end up winning that fight because the cow has some very unique fighting skills for dealing with, with predators. And one of the things that they will actually do is they will actually try to get the wolf or the coyote to follow them into water. 
because when a when a when a cow gets in the water, it's much more capable of defending itself. They will actually oftentimes win. They'll tire the they'll actually tire the coyote out and they'll actually win the fight. So it's kind of interesting, but and this kind of helps support that that feeling, I think. Okay, this was a shot with my 1D Mark II. It was shot with my 150 to 600 again. I, everything was shot with my 150 to 600. I'm going to stop saying that now. You know, everything in this set was shot with that lens. Uh, it was shot at 468 millimeters, 1 320th of a second, ISO 640. Okay, next image. Okay, this is the uh, the bull elk again, the the alpha bull elk, and in this image you can see actually some behavior and I, I actually like this shot um unfortunately you can see the Catalucci church i think that was the Catalucci church it might have been no this is one of the houses uh you can see in the background there so it kind of i don't know it's i don't like that aspect but what you're seeing here is this elk is actually smelling or sniffing the air to determine if there are any cows in estrus if there are any cows that are ready to mate and you will see them tilt their head back like this and kind of smell the air and the other thing they'll do oftentimes when they tilt their head back like that you'll hear them bugle um, this guy did not bugle in this particular instance but it's kind of an interesting thing to watch and the the sound of the bugle is a is a very interesting thing it's it's like nothing you've ever heard and it's shocking to actually see an animal that big create such a high-pitched whistle. It's very interesting. This guy, uh, again, he's kind of, he was kind of sedate for that time of year. Uh, I think mostly the rain and his age were catching up with him. You can see in this picture also, if you look carefully, uh, on his, I guess, the right, the back antler here, you can see where he has lost one of his uh, tines on his antler, most likely from fighting another bull uh, who is trying to take over the herd. So this really helps tell the story. Again, behavior. You're looking for behavior in your shots. And I know, I know it's not, this is not going to win any competitions, guys. But, you know, you're, you're looking for that behavior. Um, this was shot at 150 millimeters, so he was actually getting quite close to me here. ISO 320. One one thousandth of a second, f6.3. By the way, um, when you get up around the one one thousandth of a second, you can shoot handheld with a shot like this pretty easily, very easily, actually. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm actually no longer using a tripod uh, at this point in the day. I'm actually using just holding the, holding the lens. So with image stabilization on. Actually, in this case, I may have actually had image stabilization turned off. Okay, next image. All right, you know, here, here again, we're telling a story. You know, when you're when you're telling a story, it's important. When you when you're thinking about photo essays, it's important to step back and get a wide shot. Uh, sometimes we call this an establishing shot. Um, sometimes we call this an environmental photograph that's, that's showing the, the elk in their environment. I, I look at this as an, an establishing shot. We know that we're in a, a wild area. We can see that. We can see the trees. We can see this massive field. We can see the bull elk to the right. We can see his cows bedded down close to one another for protection, for, for body heat. Um, we can even tell that one or two of these is a calf if we look closely. But this supports the story. I always look to, to do this when I can. I've got my 150 to 600 pulled back to 184 millimeters, f6.3, 1 320th of a second at ISO 500. I did shoot this handheld. I should, well, I take that back. This was tripod mounted. Um, and with this particular lens, you don't want to, generally, you don't want to use vibration compensation or optical stabilization with, uh, with this kind of, uh, image. So, all right, next image. Oh, that's it. 
that's it for uh, the next image. If if you if you keep looking through those images, you'll see other images from Catalucci. That was from my trip earlier in the year, where I mostly photograph cows. So, um, but that's pretty much it for Catalucci. Catalucci, you know, it's it's not, you know, don't expect it to be Yellowstone. It's it's not Yellowstone, but it is a great place to go if you're in North Carolina, if you're visiting, you know, especially if you're visiting the Cades Cove area, you could take a short trip or if you're in, or if you're in uh, Cherokee gambling, <laughs> you can make a short trip east of there and you will be right there at Catalucci. Also worth mentioning, if you're in that area, Cherokee, I am told, I have not I have not actually seen this. But I was told while I was there that there are elk that hang out at the visitor center um, in uh, in Cherokee, and that could be a good opportunity for you know close shots, um, portraits, you know that type of thing. So definitely get out there and give it a try. It, it looks like a uh, a good opportunity in 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 Cherokee. So I'm not gonna have uh, a know your subject segment. Uh, in this episode simply because this whole episode has been about the elk and and how to photograph the elk. I would say that, you know, please continue to support the podcast. And, you know, if you can do it monetarily, great. If you can't, I'm cool with that. But I would ask that you please go out to iTunes and rate the podcast. Click the subscribe button. Let me know what you think. Let me know what kind of topics you want to see. Also, you know, Please get the word out. Spread spreading the word through social media is probably one of the best things that you can do. Um, you can check out uh, my website. Check out the the all the free information out there. There's uh, I I put out fairly often. I put a uh, an article out there. You know I blog regularly, so check that out. Check out my YouTube site again. Um, I got the just a quick video out there on my trip to Catalucci to kind of support this whole podcast release. I'm sorry it's not super professional quality. I'm not a videographer and I just wanted to throw something together to show people Catalucci. Anyway, that's it. Thanks for listening. Make it a great day and get out there and enjoy nature. Bye-bye. <laughs>